So, good afternoon. My name is Jared Skolton. I have worked as a senior TV consultant in KNCB since 2007, and I will moderate the webinar as well as the questions and answers at the end. We welcome you to this webinar on infection prevention and control of acute respiratory infections at all levels of the healthcare sector. This webinar is the first of a series of KNCV COVID-19 webinars. KNCV is also developing e <laughs> Please mute your mic, everyone. Thank you. Um, this webinar is the first of a series. KNCV is also developing e-learning packages and information materials, such as posters, short videos, and job aids. We will record this webinar and make it publicly available to you as long as you um, give us your email address or you can find it on our website. Throughout this webinar, you can use the chat box, the, the square roundish icon below, to ask questions or make comments. Um, we will try to address all the comments in the question and answer session at the end of the webinar, but otherwise we will do this subsequently with your email address. When you submit questions or comments for technical issues, please select everyone. When you have a problem with using the WebEx platform, such as you cannot hear sound, please select only KNCV host and chat. Today we will have three speakers followed by the questions and answers. Dr. Max Mice is our presenter. Max started working in, at KNCV in 2009 as a senior consultant, assisting national TV programs to develop and implement infection prevention and control interventions. Currently, he provides technical assistance to various national TV programs on strategic planning and programming in Africa and Asia. This presentation will take approximately 20 minutes, followed by reflections on patient's perspective, Dr. Haruna Adamov, from WHO Nigeria's Bauchi office. Dr. Emperor, who leads the National TB and Leprosy Control Program of the Nigeria Global Fund TB Grant Program Management Unit, will thereafter present the COVID-19 response related to IPC in Nigeria. For the question and answer session, please ask any question or make any comment in the chat box throughout the presentations. Two panel members, Dr. Ms. Dafa Guidado, KNCV's Interim Executive Director, and Damas, uh, Dr. Amos Amuni, WHO Nigeria National Professional Officer, will provide additional perspectives along with Max Haruna and Emperor in the question and answer session. So I now uh, present to you Dr. Max Mice. Thank you, Jared, for the kind introductions, and uh, good uh, afternoon to everyone. So the overall objective uh, of uh, my presentation is to provide an overview of current WHO recommended IPC strategies and community mitigation interventions that will help to strengthen preparedness and outbreak management of acute respiratory infections in general, and to reduce transmission of SARS-CoV-2, the virus causing COVID-19, in particular. After the webinar, I hope that you will be able to define appropriate IPC strategies for COVID-19, including contact and droplet precautions for healthcare facilities, and to design a COVID-19 response that is targeted and tailored to the local context for various community settings. Before I start, I'd like to refer to the excellent webinars by the Union of last week, and by the Stop to Be partnership in collaboration with the NTB Transmission Initiative on masks and respirators of last Tuesday. Recordings of these webinars should be available on their websites. First, I will briefly touch in this webinar on what is currently known about the spread of SARS-CoV-2. Then, as the core of my presentation, I will discuss recommended infection prevention and control, IPC, and mitigation interventions for, for every. I will ask your special attention for possible effects of COVID-19 responses on essential health services, including TB care and prevention. 
Further, I will share some lessons learned from the Netherlands and end with a take-home message before I hand back to Jared. The WHO COVID-19 interactive dashboard as of 17 June shows most recent by countries reported numbers of confirmed cases. The larger dark blue circles represent the most impacted countries. On 31st of December 2019, China reported to WHO a cluster of patients from Wuhan with atypical pneumonia. In January, the virus rapidly spread by travelers from China to other countries in Asia, North America, Europe, Australia. On 30 January, COVID-19 was declared a public health emergency of international concern, when approximately 8,000 confirmed cases had been reported by 19 countries. On 11 March, COVID-19 was declared a pandemic, when 114 countries had reported approximately 120,000 confirmed cases. And currently, there are more than 8 million and 440,000 dead. In June, most new cases are reported from South America, with Brazil as the new epicenter of the world. Never was the number of daily confirmed new cases globally as high as now including cases, though smaller numbers than thought, reported by countries on the African continent, the South Africa and Nigeria as epicenters. SARS-CoV, the coronavirus causing the severe acute respiratory syndrome, SARS, known from the outbreak in 2002, and other coronaviruses have a reservoir in bats. The coronavirus causing the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, or MERS, known since 2012, has a reservoir in camels. The reservoir of SARS-CoV-2, the coronavirus causing COVID-19, is not yet known. The mode of transmission is via direct or indirect contact from contaminated surfaces and via large and medium-sized respiratory secretion droplets from person to person. As for TB, airborne transmission via micro droplets is very likely, but not yet proven. Susceptible hosts for COVID-19 are elderly people and people with underlying comorbidities, especially obesity, diabetes, hypertension, and chronic lung disease. As for TB, health workers are at increased occupational risk. Portals of entry are the nose, mouth, and eyes. SARS-CoV-2 receptor recognition mechanism regulate, regulates its infectivity, pathogenesis, and host range. After recognizing and binding with the receptors, the virus enters and multiplies in the human airway epithelial cells. The arrows in the picture point to virus particles inside these epithelial cells. Onset of symptoms is 2 to 14 days after exposure. The incubation period is 5 to 6 days with a range of 1 to 14 days. There are indications that COVID-19 is already infectious one to two days before the onset of symptoms, corresponding with peak viremia at the end of the incubation period. The duration of infectiousness is typically around eight days. Severely ill patients may be infectious for a longer period. It is thought from contact tracing that around 16% of patients do not develop any symptoms while most patients develop only mild symptoms. Common signs and symptoms include fever, cough, shortness of breath, loss of smell and taste, body and muscle pains, and fatigue. Around 15% of patients have severe signs and symptoms of bilateral pneumonia and acute respiratory distress syndrome with hypoxemia. Approximately 5% of patients are critically ill with respiratory failure sepsis, disseminated intravascular coagulation, and multi-organ failure. Transmission of infectious disease is characterized by the basic reproductive number, or R0, defined as the mean number of secondary cases generated by one primary case, when the population is largely susceptible to infection. The RE the effective reproductive number is referred to if the population includes both susceptible and non-susceptible persons. So for COVID-19, the R0 is 2.5, ranging from 2 to 3 people infected. 
for infrared, for example, the R0 is 1.1 to 1.5, and for TB, the effective reproductive number RE is thought to vary greatly between low and high incidence settings from less than one to greater than four, respectively. Another parameter characterizing transmission is the serial interval or doubling time, the time it takes for an infected person to pass on the infection to others. So the SI for COVID-19 is five days, ranging from 4.4 4 to, 4 .4 to 7.5 days. The SI for influenza is shorter, two and a half days, and the SI for TB is thought to be much longer, from approximately six months to over one and a half years. WHO interim guidance on recommended IPC strategies to prevent or limit transmission of COVID-19 in healthcare facilities was published in January and updated in March this year. Guidance for COVID-19 was based on WHO guidance for MERS, which had been updated very recently in October 2019. These strategies are, one, ensuring triage, early recognition, and source control. A system for assessing all patients at admission, allowing for early recognition of possible COVID-19 and immediate isolation or separation of these patients in an area separate from other patients. Two, applying standard precautions and practices for all patients. Three, implementing administrative controls for health workers and patients. And five, using environmental and engineering controls aiming to ensure adequate ventilation in all areas in the healthcare facility based on risk assessment, spatial separation at least of at least one meter, and cleaning and disinfection procedures. In the next slides, I will further elaborate on standard contact, droplet, and airborne precautions and practices and administrative controls for COVID-19. Administrative controls control measures include training in IPC, ensuring an adequate patient to staff ratio, for example, one nurse for two intensive care unit patients, ensuring adequate supplies and proper universal or targeted use of personal protective equipment, PPE, establishing surveillance among health workers for hospital acquired infections potentially caused by COVID-19, ensuring access to prompt laboratory testing for health workers with signs and symptoms suggested for COVID-19, and ensuring and adherence to IPC policies and procedures for all aspects of healthcare, particularly on educating patients, preventing overcrowding, using dedicated waiting areas for presumptive patients, ensuring access to prompt lab testing for patients, and isolating or separating hospitalized patients. Standard precautions, especially the ones in bold that you see, hand and respiratory hygiene, use of PPE and cleaning and disinfection, must be implemented and adhered to for COVID-19. Use of PPE, such as gloves and gowns, eye protection and respiratory protection for standard precautions is based on risk assessment. However, universal use of medical masks is recommended for health workers in clinical areas in geographic settings where there is known or suspected community transmission of COVID-19. To prevent transmission of SARS-CoV-2 via direct or indirect contact, health workers must use PPE and disposable or dedicated patient equipment and avoid contaminated services such as doorknobs and light switches, including their medical masks, and frequently clean and disinfect services and equipment. Patients should stay in a single patient room or separated from others by at least one meter in a shared patient room. Movement out of that room must be limited. To prevent transmission of SARS-CoV-2 via large and medium droplets, produced by infectious COVID-19 patients, health workers should use PPE, including a fluid-resistant apron or protective suit when within one meter of the patient. However, based on values and preferences and if readily available, respirators could also be used instead of medical masks. Patients should be admitted 
in rooms with adequate natural ventilation of 60 liter per second per occupant and always use a medical mask when not in the room, additional to the contact precautions. To prevent airborne transmission via micro droplets, droplets or aerosols, health workers should wear a FFP2 or equivalent N95 respirator or higher when performing aerosol generating procedures as the listed examples. Patients should be treated in well-ventilated procedure rooms with 120 liter per second per occupant in case of natural ventilation or negative pressure rooms with at least 12 air changes per hour and controlled direction of airflow using mechanical ventilation or additional to contact and droplet precautions. When a new infectious disease with pandemic potential emerges, community mitigation interventions must be considered for high-risk community settings. Community mitigation interventions are especially important before a vaccine or drug becomes widely available, as is the case at the moment with COVID-19. The goals are to slow community transmission and protect individuals at increased risk for severe illness, including health workers, older adults, and persons of any age with underlying health conditions. Community mitigation interventions are containment, social distancing, hand hygiene, limiting movement, avoiding crowded environments, and source control using non-medical masks worn by an infected individual to prevent onward transmission. In the next slides, I will elaborate on containment and social distancing. The objectives of containment is to reduce the basic reproductive number in order to minimize morbidity and associated mortality, avoid an epidemic peak that overwhelms healthcare services, and flatten the epidemic curve to wait for vaccine development and effective antiviral drug therapy. Desired outcome is a 60% reduction of transmission, pushing down the R0 from 2.5 to below 1. Through wide-scale community testing of anyone with COVID-like complaints, isolation of anyone who tested positive, tracing contacts of confirmed COVID-19 patients, and placing contacts without symptoms in quarantine for 14 days. If contacts have symptoms, the cycle starts again. They will be tested and go in self-isolation, ideally within one day from onset of symptoms. Shortening this time from onset of symptoms to isolation is vital, as it will reduce transmission and therefore likely slow the epidemic. The greater the reduction in transmission, the longer and flatter the epidemic curve, with the risk of resurgence when community interventions are lifted to mitigate, for example, economic impact. The figure shows illustrative simulations of a transmission model. A baseline simulation with case isolation only and no social distancing, the red line with the high peak. A simulation with moderate social distancing in place throughout the epidemic, flattening the curve, the green line with the lower peak and the simulation with more effective, extensive social distancing in place for a limited period only, typically followed by a resurgent epidemic when social distancing is halted, the blue line with the two peaks. On the right, the same simulation scenarios with no or moderate or extensive social distancing are depicted in another way, showing the uninfected proportion of the population, the sky blue areas, the infected proportion of the population, the brown areas, and the proportion of the population cured over time, the purple areas, as a result of these different scenarios. In the no social distancing scenario on the top, the whole population that has survived will have built immunity against the virus. In the extensive social distancing scenario at the bottom, there will still be a significant proportion of uninfected people that have not built immunity against the virus and who may become ill during next flares of the disease. 
Health services become increasingly disrupted as a country moves from sporadic cases to community transmission of the coronavirus. The WHO survey, which was completed by 155 countries in May, confirmed that the impact is global. Rehabilitation, hypertension, diabetes, cancer services, and cardiovascular emergencies have been disrupted in a significant proportion of reporting countries. Policies widely adopted in response to the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, particularly reassignments of health personnel and equipment are also impacting the performance of TB care and prevention services, for example. WHO's global TB program estimates that a global decrease of 25% in TB detection will lead to a predicted additional 190,000 TB deaths, a 13% increase in 2020. And the lasting effect for years to come beyond 2020 is likely if essential health services are not restored in the shortest possible time after the surge or not maintained during following surges as modeling suggests. While stringent COVID-19 responses may only last one to three months, they would have lasting impact on TB in high burden settings. A modeling study was conducted extrapolating the estimates of three high burden countries, India, Kenya, and Ukraine. And globally, a worst case scenario of a three months lockdown and a protracted 10 months restoration period would lead to an additional 6.3 million TB patients and an additional 1.4 million TB deaths by 2025, implying a setback of five to eight years in the fight against TB due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Let's prevent that worst case scenario. The map of the Netherlands shows regional differences of hospital admissions with a gradient largely from southeast to the north, as you can see. Community transmission started in the south during annual carnival festivities on 23 to 25 February. As of June, approximately 49,000 patients have been diagnosed of whom one quarter was hospitalized. Of the hospital admissions, close to 3,000 patients were admitted at the ICU, of whom one third has died. In total, approximately 6,000 deaths have been reported, but the true toll of the pandemic is estimated at 8,900 excess deaths, or an excess mortality of 38%. The Dutch moderate social distancing approach or what we call here the intelligent lockdown, reduced the R0 to 0.87, despite the inadequate PCR test capacity, only allowing people in the beginning who were hospitalized or with a higher risk of severe illness to be tested. It is only since 1 June, after three months, that, every, that anyone with symptoms can be tested in one of the 80 tests streets with a maximum capacity of 30,000 tests daily for the whole country. Now for IPC, the lessons learned were that temporary structures such as tents and containers had to be installed and equipped to serve as triage facilities. And ordinary patient rooms had to be transformed into temporary cohort wards and isolation rooms to separate COVID-19 patients from other patients. Lastly, Due to shortages of medical masks and, medical masks and respirators, proper recommended use in primary and home care settings was not implemented until recently. So this is my last slide and take home message. While there is no effective and preventive treatment or a vaccine, the COVID-19 response should be tailored to the local context and targeted and targeted, informed by national and subnational data, gearing up, winding down when and where necessary. And the response should be based on well-established and proven IPC strategies that we've just discussed, implementing administrative and environmental controls, as well as standard contact droplet and airborne precautions at healthcare facilities. But at the same time, keeping effects on health services including TB care and prevention within acceptable levels, 
and preventing setbacks in achieving global and national strategic targets. Thank you for your attention. Stay tuned, stay healthy. And I hand back to Jared. Thank you, Max, for the comprehensive and enlightening presentation. For the audience, please don't forget to ask Max your questions or comments to him in the chat box. Um, I don't see much chat in the chat box yet, so we would like to hear from you. I now introduce Dr. Haruna Adamu, who will give a testimonial about his harrowing experience with COVID-19. Over to you, Dr. Adamu. Thank you. Thank you, Gerard. Thank you. I would like to start by thanking the, the organizers of this uh, webinar. And uh, it is truly an honor to be one of those presenters in this um, maiden edition. And I hope that the experience I'm going to share will help uh, my colleagues all over the world to, to know that COVID-19 is real and to take care of all the precautions so that they stay healthy together with their loved ones. On the 16th of April 2020, I started sneezing with chills and fever while working alone in my office in Bauchi, northeastern Nigeria. As a result, I decided to leave my work and return home to rest and recuperate from the stress I thought I had accumulated following my return journey from Kano, a city second level in terms of COVID-19 burden, according to the official data from the Nigeria Center for Disease Control and Prevention. The following day, I found out via social media that one of my contacts in Kano had tested positive COVID for COVID-19. This prompted me to demand for a test. My sample was taken on the 18th of April and 24 hours later, the result came back as, negative, as positive. I was immediately ev evacuated with an ambulance to one of the COVID-19 isolation centers. The isolation facility provided me with 24 hour services. I was given a private room with a bed, bed sheet, blanket, toilet, bath, air conditioner, television, fridge, and a drawer. I was immediately evaluated by a medical team that placed me on an intensive treatment regimen, including oral tablets, IV fluids, and injections in a phased manner based on my evolving symptoms and severity of the illness. The team further informed me that the medicines were the routine ones for the treatment of COVID-19 patients and not for study purposes. Furthermore, my vital signs were continuously monitored. Blood pressure, pulse rate, uh, percentage SpO2, temperature, and respiratory rate. Meals and drinking water were provided three times per day. Lastly, I was provided with a hotline to call the nursing station when and if the need arises. From day one of my admission up to discharge, I received tremendous and consistent psychosocial support from my employer, family members, friends, colleagues. I received telephone calls and text messages daily to encourage, comfort, and assure me that all was going to be well. I was not allowed any visitors, not even my family members, for the entire 21 days. I was only seeing medical and health workers and support staff coming into my room dressed in the same white attire with apron, respirator, eye goggles, several layers of hand gloves, long boots, etc. Thus, I was not able to identify them individually except when they introduced themselves. For the first 10 days, I battled with high fever, dryness of the mouth and throat, loss of smell and appetite, diarrhea, extreme body weakness, generalized body pains, cough, which was initially dry, but later became productive of dark brownish sputum. I was fortunate not to have had any breathing difficulties or chest pain. Otherwise, I would have required oxygen supplementation through either nasal tube or mechanical ventilator, which were all available in the intensive care unit of the facility. The doctors and nurses did their best to treat my symptoms and encouraged me to be strong. I remember a nurse 
who after realizing how terrified I was, I saw the tears in my eyes, comforted me that, that I had a moderate disease and that she had seen patients with much worse conditions recover fully. This and many other assurances gave me courage to stand strong against the virus. After the 10th day on admission, the fever and other symptoms began to subside gradually and almost disappeared on the 12th day. However, no sooner had my symptoms subsided than I began to get bored, sitting or lying down alone in, in the room, except when the doctors or nursing staff came in to provide services. The TV and my smartphone kept me company most of the time as I began to watch movies and place telephone calls and text messages to family members, friends, and colleagues. I was initially watching local and world news to catch up, but later stopped as I found them disturbing due to COVID-19. On the 15th day of admission, a follow-up sample was taken using two swab sticks, one from my nose and the other from the pharynx. And 72 hours later, the result came out as negative. Based on existing guidelines and protocols, another sample was obtained in the same manner for the final test. Again, 72 hours later, the result was pronounced negative and I was immediately discharged home and united with my family. This was one of the happiest moments of my life. I suddenly realized that I was free and felt as if life would start afresh. My family was happy to, and excited to have me back. Following my discharge, I decided to remain indoors for about two weeks, mainly to catch up with my family and to be sure that I became normal. Within this period, my wife narrated to me how immediately after the ambulance took me away, a team of environmental health officers from the Ministry of Health closed the street leading to our compound, disinfected our home, and collected samples from all for testing. Almost in tears, she told me how neighbors avoided her and our kids. However, this attitude improved when the family's results came out as negative, and none of them had developed any symptoms. When my neighbor who realized I was back home, many called or texted to congratulate me for having survived the deadly virus. After this rehabilitation period, I began to go out of my house daily for 30 minutes work, and this really helped me to meet people physically while observing COVID-19 preventive measures. Gradually, life came back to normal. When I assumed work through teleworking, I was amazed at the outpouring of love and support from my colleagues to the extent that I felt like a hero or a celebrity as my story suddenly became viral. So I'm a living witness that COVID-19 is real. And so those who are skept still skeptical should have a rethink because as somebody who has experienced its symptoms, I do not wish that any person contracts it. it. It is a nasty experience that could go either way, either recovery or death. So the best approach is prevention. We must accept to stay at home, and if we must go out, observe social distancing and other preventive measures recommended by WHO and authorities. This we must do for the sake of our families, the larger society, and most importantly, for our health heroes, the frontline health and medical workers who continue to risk their lives and those of their loved ones. Post-COVID-19, I will redouble my efforts to ensure that I and my family members remain healthy and enjoy quality life. As a health and humanitarian professional, I will continue to offer help and support to those in need, especially the weak and vulnerable in the society. This is to further contribute my quota towards building a better, healthier future for people around the world. All said and done, I would like to give all the glory to the Almighty God, whose grace held me completely from COVID-19, so that I may have another chance in life to continue to serve humanity. I must also thank the isolation facility staff for their selfless service to COVID-19 patients. They were obviously well prepared, adhering to protocols, and well protected with adequate PPE. This is my story. Thank you very much for your attention. Over. applause. We are so happy that you're still with us. Mm. So, thank
thank you again for that powerful. Thank you so much. Thank you. So uh, back to the audience. Uh, please remember to add your questions or comments to the chat box. Um, and I will now introduce Dr. Emperor, who will provide a summary of the Nigeria response on COVID-19 infection prevention and control. Over to you, Dr. Emperor. May have his mute on. Okay. In the meantime, while we're sorting out um, getting Dr. Emperor's um, um, presentation together, um, there were some people who had um, a question uh, for Dr. Haruna. Um, Emmanuel um, was asking, what was the standard treatment that you were put on? Okay, shall I respond to that? Uh, yes, please. Yeah, yes. Uh, actually, I, I realized that the treatment I received was basically symptomatic um, because there were some people that did not have symptoms and they were just kept in isolation without giving them any medication. But in my own case, because I presented with symptoms like I enumerated in my story, I was given medications. For instance, uh, I was given because I had diarrhea, I was given intravenous fluids, um, basically Rinder's lactate and uh, full strength Daros, you know, to, to kind of rehydrate me. Because also I had fever, I was given um, uh, antipyretics. I was on injection paracetamol three times daily. I was also placed on chloroquine tablets uh, for five days. I was also because I, you know, you remember I told you I had a cough, which was initially dry. Later on, it was productive, and the the sputum was darkish brown. So I was placed on antibiotics, um, intravenous uh, uh, antibiotics to take care of, of, of the cough. And then probably they had they thought I had a pneumonia or something. I had an infection, and I was also given tablets as a tromycin for seven days. And then because of the extreme body weakness, I, my UNE was done and my potassium was low. So I was placed on uh, potassium supplementation uh, just to, to, to take care of the body weakness. Uh, so these were the, basically the, the treatment that I received. Whenever I make a complaint, uh, they check me, my vital signs, and uh, give me appropriate treatment. But like I said, I was lucky I didn't have any breathlessness. My 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 oh, the oximeter always showed uh, my uh, my my blood was well oxygenated between the region of ninety seven percent and ninety nine percent. I hope I have answered your question. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Haruna. I think you answered it very well. There's another question for um, for Max. Um, so um, Max, this is from. Ch Wubuka uh from WHO to everyone. He said, thank you for the presentation. Given the low R well, of community transmission in the Netherlands, what were the components of intelligent, intelligent platform implemented? Thank you very much for, for that question. I don't think we were low in the beginning. I think uh, we were like all the other countries around the uh, um, R0 of 2.5. So when community transmission was going on, especially in, as you have seen on the map in the south and in, in the middle of the, the country, um, this, was, this was that high. So the intelligent lockdown, what happened actually is that 
um, the interventions that I mentioned, uh, the social distancing, keep one and a half meter, we say, in the Netherlands distance from anybody else, hand washing, um, all these things were gradually, we would say in phases, um, introduced in the country. So gradually it became uh, more stringent. Um, in the beginning, we could still go to our jobs. Later on, uh, we should work at home as much as possible. And I think in the end, we were almost in the same situation as other European countries like Italy and Spain and even Belgium. Um, that is, uh, you know, as you know, neighboring uh, the Netherlands. Um, so it is a little bit uh, with, a, with, a, with, a, with a blink that I'm saying the intelligent lockdown because we were also blamed by our neighbors. We were also blamed that we were not going into a stringent lockdown as they were. And borders were closed in Europe. Can you imagine where we have free um, movement from one country to another country? Um, so intelligent lockdown, yes, it was meant to be like that. But in the end, I think gradually we, um, we, we were uh, coming up to a real total lockdown. And at the moment, you can also see that the lifting of the lockdown is in the same way. It, um, the lifting is done in phases up to the 1st of September. And maybe uh, for you to know, and that's when I want to stop, is a big discussion in, in the Netherlands and in other European countries on closure of schools and how uh, sensible is that in, in, in this uh, epidemic. We know that these young children and even adolescents are not as affected as the elderly adult people, but transmission may still be and play an important role. So there's still discussion on that, uh, on that specific uh, intervention. I'll stop here, thank you. Thank you, Max. Um, I am wondering how we should proceed. Um, it looks like Emperor is trying to join in. Um, um, Let's just give him one more minute. Okay. See if he can get in. I could also log off um, and. Um, so the problem was that it was full, Rachel. Yeah, it's it's not supposed to be, but apparently we're running into that issue. So sure. trying yeah. to figure it out now, but let's okay. see. I see that. Uh, yes, good. So we. Got... has joined us now, actually. Fantastic. Great. Fantastic. Great. Not a round of applause. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I can start. Yes, yes please. please. All right. Uh, good evening, all. Uh, my name is M Emperor Obotrama from National TV Program in Nigeria. Um, and uh, full introduction, talking on IPC based on uh, the current uh, pandemic of uh, COVID. Uh, the first case was identified in 27th of uh, February 2020, and we have uh, 29 PCR. Capacity for PCR testing is about 1,200 to 1,500, and we anticipate that uh, we have identified one genus part per state to be utilized for the testing for COVID. Uh, we anticipate that express cartridge of about 214,000 have been booked on behalf of the country uh, through the support of several organizations, including KNCV. Uh, 6,000 is already in country, and uh, that's uh, starting from Kaduna. State. We have 112 uh, treatment and isolation centers and uh, in 35 states plus FCT and with the capacity of the bay is uh, 5,000. Now looking at the trend, uh, this information is based on 16 June 2020. You can see uh, for the initial beginning of the trend, you can find that there's spikes of uh, days where a lot of cases are being detected and is increasing with even as the days of the lockdown, uh, the principles and policies of lockdown are reducing, uh, the cases are also increasing as it stands now. But uh, that 16th of June, we have uh, 103,000, 79,000 uh, test samples tested, and then we have 17 confirmed cases. These are laboratory confirmations. However, those that are presented with symptoms are about 11,070. We have discharged 5,623 patients, while we have recorded a number of 455 deaths. Now, looking at currently, the infection is 
now uh, seem to have occurred all over the country. However, we have three states that are where the epidemic is high. That is Lagos, uh, Federal Capital Territory, Abuja, and also Kano. Uh, for us, the ratio, uh, we are finding out that when you look at uh, the proportion of infection among men and females, we have about 67% uh, of the males uh, having the cases, while the females are 33. Our majority of age group that are infected are about 31 to 40 years, and uh, that may actually account for the few, uh, the rate of recovery and also the few deaths that we are recording. Now, this slide is trying to show that Actually, uh, Lagos being also the place where the infection was first noted, uh, actually having the highest number of uh, cases also being detected. However, this also this may, may be true, actually, but for other states, we should also know that the testing capacity of other states are very low, and therefore may result uh, in the low, low number of uh, cases being detected in the state. But looking at Lagos state population and density, uh, you, and also being the place where the infection uh, was noted first, you may uh, see that uh, the place is being uh, take, is always leading in the number of infected cases, and therefore, majority of the country cases are in Lagos State. Now, when we looked at the impact of it, it boils down to several things: fear, um, lack of courage, uh, non preparedness of a uh, healthcare system in terms of trying to at, uh, address some of the key challenges. One of the key things that have affected was the patronage of the hospital. Uh, programs like uh, TB, the sites are, low, are having low patronage, and therefore you can see that a lot of patients are no longer com coming. Uh, we are tracking the data on this area, uh, so you may not see numbers, but for the few ones we are looking at, Based on facility, we are noticing that the outpatient number are reducing, the activities are affected, program activities are affected, uh, like I said, low OPD attendees, uh, which is also uh, resulting to low TB uh, cases being screened. Uh, we're also looking at community TB case findings are also being interrupted because people are not moving as they are ought to move. Uh, then there is also increasing in stigma as people are beginning to fear that uh, once you arrive in the hospital and you're coughing, that uh, the first thing is to quarantine you because you are now a candidate for COVID. So all these have impacted on program uh, drastically. Now, if you look at the testing, our second usually if you look at TB testing, usually we have as the cases are as we used to have spikes as the moons are going up. Uh, although there is no a comparison, but that would have been nice to have initial comparison. But you know, having historical knowledge of the, pre, the, the TB uh, data, you find that each month has an increase and spike in number of uh, testing. But this, we are now noticing that now instead of having that spike, you can notice that in March there was a very sharp drop in uh, March from March to uh, April. And although there is a little rise in May, but that has not been able to match what we used to have in the past being that we have high number of uh, testing in this period, and that has affected also in the resultant case finding. Everything has a negative and a positive aspect, and why I brought this aspect, although I may focus on TB generally, but generally there is an, a health system strengthening impact on COVID, because now government and every other person is looking how to strengthen the healthcare system to ensure that everything you do in healthcare system, uh, that, uh, that, that readiness in the healthcare system is important. For us, we are, they are, we are using the COVID community approach to increase awareness for TB. Also, we are also, when we are bringing COVID issues on the table, especially for testing, we are also bringing TB at that level for political awareness, increasing political awareness among uh, the, 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 the political leaders. Uh, for infection control, you bear me most of the issues is that most hospitals are not, let's say the laboratory areas, uh, have no uh, equipment for infection control. So now we are, uh, la we are now using this opportunity to improve the laboratory aspect by procurement of uh, biosafety cabinet, 
personal protective equipment for them and also to renovate some of the key labs in the country. So these are actually benefits that at the long run the program stands to utilize and benefit from. The expansion network for TB uh, gene expert is increasing as most recently most governors are already procuring more gene experts since some of those gene experts have been a max for testing for uh, COVID and therefore they are trying to expand also their testing capacity to ensure that they have more gene expert network that will help in, uh, in testing. Therefore, these also are also going to be benefited from for TB. Thank you. Just a brief explanation that uh, the country is not fighting this fight alone. We have been able to get the, the programming support through Global Fund uh, and about uh, $6 million has been marked and these are areas you can see because of the key importance of uh, uh, infection control, majority of the of the costs are actually on infection control, uh, by infested cabinets uh, and also issues of infection management of waste. You can see those areas have high costs. So this shows that there is more focus on the country to ensure that infection control is technically and all so taken care of during this period, which is key for transmission and to reduce the fear among healthcare workers. I bet to tell you that the fear in healthcare workers are increasing, as we have noticed that even about 16% of the healthcare workers on the frontline fight have also been infected with TB, so uh, with uh, COVID, and therefore the area of IPC is very, very key. We, the major thing we have done here is to showcase that uh, the infection prevention control strategies have also been adopted for support by the country uh, through the uh, NCDC, which is the, uh, spearheading the COVID intervention. Uh, they are trying to make sure that the community transmissions, uh, as the country is experiencing community transmission, there is need for uh, strategies that will combat both community and healthcare infection in the co infection control. And therefore, they are trying to make sure that things like uh, community transmission, that the healthcare workers infected uh, are also taken care of. Uh, the priority uh, is given for infection control to ensure that healthcare facilities are also protected. The general principle of infection control for healthcare facilities are being implemented. And the key approach here is ensuring that patients are triaged as they are coming in right from the gate. Now, to elaborate more, we also see that uh, uh, personal protective equipment are being uh, considered mostly for the uh, facilities. We're also monitoring the infection control indicators for COVID uh, using also TB indicators. We are also combining because every program is trying to, la uh, to lash on what the other one is doing. We have also have gotten the funding request for the C-19, the latest uh, request from Global Fund. We have just gotten approval for it uh, as at uh, two days ago. And that also, has, uh, also, if you look at the majority of the aspect, is focusing on infection control, trying to make sure that the equipment needed for infection control and testing are actually considered and are procured for this period. Yeah, this slide, uh, sorry for the slide, may be very, very narrow, but it's just trying to show the algorithm for triaging in healthcare facilities that are being used. Uh, we, the intervention for infection control for most fa for these facilities are coming right from the gate. We are there, they ensure that there's social distancing and patients are already screened in, uh, there's a screening area uh, that uh, is in, inside the hospital. And then the ask patient department, uh, department also is ensured that uh, social distancing. Then people, after the uh, screening, people are also isolated where they are supposed to do for quarantine. So you can, uh, that's the process they are using. The key concerns here remain that um, uh, hospitals to strictly adhere to this process have been an ongoing issue. So there are a set of people set up to make sure that uh, these activities are monitored, especially in the high burden facilities. Overall, the, the key message here is to see that uh, uh, for us as a country, there is that unpreparedness to infection control, especially in our healthcare facilities, and awareness to infection control remains very low. 
and this needs uh, COVID intervention are ready to come out in the uh, as a burning issue uh, and a discussion that countries need to prepare themselves for interventions like this because we are not sure whether this may be the last epidemic that may happen and we should be able to prepare ourselves as a country to address this issue as soon as they appear. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Emperor, for the brilliant presentation, which helps us to understand what you have gone through in Nigeria and how you've addressed it thus far. I now ask the audience to ask Emperor questions in the chat box if they have not done so, and any other questions related to the materials presented thus far. I see that there is a question for Max, um, another question for Max uh, from Dr. Omoni. Um, great presentation. What is your thought about herd immunity? <laughs> okay, thank Hello. you very much, Dr. Omoni. Uh, how are you? Um, thank you for that question. Um, Actually, you're, you're reminding me about the, the beginning of this uh, outbreak in the Netherlands, where the prime minister on national television mentioned that the goal of the lockdown, the intelligent lockdown, was exactly building this herd immunity. Um, and, and he had to come back to this, because as you've heard in my presentation, building the herd immunity is not the goal. It is something that can be reached depending on how much social distancing you, you apply, but it, it should not be a, a goal in itself. I think we are all working towards a vaccine. We're all working towards that. Uh, herd immunity, by the way, if you take that as the highest, um, not goal, but important thing in this, uh, in this uh, fight against COVID-19, then you are really asking too much of the health uh, care uh, sector. Uh, because that is what we have seen in the Netherlands. It was just um, it was just a few patients away from having no place anymore in our intensive care units. A totally different, by the way, ep epidemic as what I've seen just now from the numbers from Nigeria and what we know in other countries as well. But I guess that in all the countries, we apply strategies, we apply interventions that have to do with keeping all those things in balance, keeping patients alive, keeping health uh, workers uh, able to continue to do their work, well protected, and herd immunity in the end would be something that could come, but not as a goal. This is my opinion on it, and thank you for that question once again. Ah, I see here, um, some of my colleagues is mentioning that um, what we are doing, of course, is we are checking at the moment, for example, in a group of, uh, of blood donors, adult blood donors, how many antibodies, uh, how many, how the percentage of them that has um, started to have ant show antibodies. So we are at the moment between three and five percent of the population. Now, if you can remember that slide that I had with the blue and the purple areas, then you can just say that 5% after the first surge is not much. But again, um, that was not the purpose of our uh, intervention. Hey, thank you, Max. So um, I know that we're running over a few minutes, but I'd like to give our other expert panelists a chance to, um, to speak. And so I'm first going to ask Dr. Omoni to um, give uh, some summary take-home messages um, for, for a minute or two for us. Thank you. Over. And if you can unmute yourself if you haven't done so already. Yes, we can hear you now. Hello? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, Omoni, we can hear you clearly. Okay, thank you, uh, Bob. <laughs> I, I like to I like to thank the presenter for for great presentation. Mars, as usual, very nice, and uh, Dr. Aruna for that experience, and Dr. Emperor for the presentations. And I like to thank Kiss 
TV for organizing the Italian Habits are more frequent. Uh, I have been I have been opportune to be at the front line myself, having served in and still working with the with the IPC pillar of the COVID response in the Federal Capital Territory. And I, I have seen daily how our cases are increasing. I have seen the evidence of you know community uh, transmissions. I, I have we have seen various lockdowns as Matt, Matt has shown in his presentation, having impact on our health services having impact on our OPD attendees, hospital patronages, and I have seen services destructed with a lot of stigma, issue of stigma, stigma from health worker, stigma from communities, as, as Dr. Azamo have pointed out. I, I, I have seen uh, quite a lot of things, but one thing that is, that is clear is that I've seen is that COVID will be with us for a long time to come. So we, as a program, we have to actually innovate in, in, in order to ensure that we are still running and surviving even with this COVID uh, intervention. So the program has to, we have to innovate. And I think, I think as the, we are making the presentation, one thing I was, looking, I was thinking about, about is that we, we now have to try to use to see how do we use the electronic more, the telemedicine, the, the VOT, you know, various electrical, uh, uh, the e, 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 e services more. I, I was thinking of that. And also, because we have seen health workers getting infected, and one of the things I, 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 I like to also point out is the, the issue of standard precautions for all health workers. Now we have to ensure that we as health facilities maintain that standard precautions at all times while seeing all facilities. And lastly, I like to say that as health workers in the facility, we have to behave like the, like, like the, like the, the military that are at the war front. We have to behave like the military at, 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 the, at the war front. We have to ensure that we do not run out, run out of our ammunition, and our ammunition here is PPE, so we have to ensure that all facilities have access to PPE at all times. We have to work like a team. You know, it, it, the military work together like a team to win the, the war. We have to work like a team. Now, the earth work, all earth workers have to work together. We have to ensure that our fellow earth workers are using the PPE, they are using it correctly, we are monitoring each other, we, we have to, because a disruption in one, if one health worker refuses to use it, it spread to others. So we have to make sure that we work together as a team and work the back of each other. And I, I like to say that, as Matt has shown in, in his presentation, this we have seen even in our data here that our cases is, redu is going to reduce if nothing is done. And we are likely to be bringing more drug resistant tuberculosis and also increasing mortality. So I'd like to thank the organizer for this program, and I'd like to say thank you for allowing me to give my own insight on this. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Omoni, for the um, excellent uh, expert opinion and sharing your experience. I now give you to our executive director, Dr. Uh, Guidado, for um, some words, please. Thank you very, very much, uh, Gerard, uh, for this excellent coordination. And I think to our presenters, a uh, fantastic job. And uh, to Dr. Haruna, I think we, 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 we thank God for your life and uh, all that you have gone through. I think it's a very good testimony uh, that you have shared with us. And I think you need to be an agent of change uh, along the line to speak at many fora uh, to continue to institutionalize this concept to avoid the, the conspiracy theories from people. I think people are wasting their energy in that direction rather than facing the, the realities. Having said that, I think I have five points, and all of them are just going to be direct for the sake of time. One is that moving forward, government and technical agencies must ensure that infection prevention and control is not a reaction to an outbreak or epidemic or a pandemic. It should be part of healthcare system. As long as it's not part of healthcare system, then we will continue to make people vulnerable, including our frontline healthcare workers. Number two, that infection prevention and control at healthcare facility is a right for healthcare workers. And so we must address it from the concept of right and compensation and labor law uh, to, to ensure that it is actually taken forward, not just uh, to go back to normal after this particular pandemic. Number three, Infection prevention and control is part of quality care standards. It is not an option. 
uh, a patient shouldn't come to a facility and leave a facility with another disease. That will be a disservice, and that is not what healthcare system are meant for. Fourthly, infection prevention and control will be a line budget for every healthcare facility. It cannot be at, at, at on. It cannot be left for, for, for chance. And therefore, healthcare facility managers must make sure that IPC is part of their routine budgetary allocation. Last but not the least, all of us public health experts must ensure epidemics, outbreaks, and pandemic does not totally disrupt healthcare services. Healthcare services for other ailments must continue, so we need to come up with a model to make sure that services continue while we are still addressing emergencies of epidemic and pandemic. And therefore, infection and prevention control, this is our moment to bring it back to the agenda, and we must ensure both government and policymakers and technical agencies give it the attention it deserves. Once again, thank you so much for you guys' insight and the presentation. And for Haruna, we wish you very, very, very good uh, more life. Uh, I think you're going to have twice the years you already have at this moment. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Girado. Thank you very much, Girado. <laughs> we are now concluding the webinar. I would like to thank all of our speakers, Dr. Max Mike, Dr. Haruna, Dr. Emperor, and our expert panelists. Dr. Omuni and Dr. Girado for their enlightening and inspirational insights. I would also like to thank the active participants for their engagement. And you may have noticed that we're all men and um, we are going to have other webinars um, that um, will include uh, visible women. We have had many women in the background supporting us, including Rachel, who was the moderator who, who helped us to get things on board, as well as some other experts in communications um, and, and IT. Um, so we really appreciate what they've done for us. So please stay safe and please stay tuned for the next segments of the COVID-19 webinar series from KNCB. Thank you so much. Have a nice day. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye, everyone.